Imagine. We've all been endowed with this gift of imagination. And I'm going to ask you to use your imagination to picture in your mind's eye a tiger. I'm going to give you a little help. Tigers have colorful stripes for camouflage. On average, tigers grow to about 11 feet, weighing more than 600 pounds. Of all cats that exist in the world today, they have the longest canine teeth, about two and a half inches long. Now I'd like you to imagine that you've just come face to face with a very unhappy tiger. What do you do? Are you fast enough to outrun the tiger? I doubt it very much. Are you strong enough to out-wrestle the tiger? I doubt that too. Why did I ask you to think about a tiger? Well, it could be because I teach at Buffalo State. And Buffalo State College, our mascot, happens to be a Bengal tiger. But that's not it. I could tell you that one of the most enjoyable reads I've had in the last year was The Life of Pi, which has been released as a major motion picture. And if you are familiar with that, then you know one of the characters in the book is a tiger. But that's not it. Tigers first appeared two million years ago. The homo genus, humans, appeared two and a half million years ago. Think about it. Look at yourself. How on earth did we ever survive given threats like that in our environment? How is that possible? Here's one answer, conformity. Psychological research done in the 1950s and 60s shows that humans have what's called a conformity bias. We tend to do what other people do. It's the way we're wired. I'll give you a visual demonstration of that. A YouTube video of an old TV program, many of you probably won't remember it, I remember it from my childhood, called Candid Camera, a hidden camera. If you're familiar with like Disaster Date, MTV, it's kind of like the precursor to Disaster Date. So in this scene from Candid Camera, there are three actors on an elevator facing the back of the elevator. And then a fourth person comes in who unknowingly is being videoed. He's not part of the program. Let's see what happens. I would try it once again. Here's the candid subject. Here comes the candid camera staff, three of them at least. And uh, this man has apparently been in groups before. So it makes you wonder, when you see something like that, how on earth did we survive? Well, there's an evolutionary advantage to conformity. In fact, there are three. The first is conformity allows for collaboration. You want to take down a great big woolly mammoth? Get some friends. It also helps in aiding with learning. By observing others, we can see them test ideas, and then we take what's successful, and we use those ourselves. And the third is it creates culture. We have shared values and norms. But if all we ever did was conform, then we wouldn't have growth. We would never try anything new. Let me try this out with you. Physical analogy. If you're holding something sharp, please put it down. And fold your arms in front of you as you would naturally. Note which forearm you have on top. I have my left forearm on top. When I asked you to put your arms together, how did that feel? Comfortable, right? Did you have to think about it? Probably not. Take your arms apart this time and weave them together so the opposite forearm ends up on top. <laughs> Some of you are trying to figure it out. Um, <laughs> same arms. 
The first time you folded your arms, that's what conformity feels like. It's comfortable. And you don't have to think. You just follow. But if that's all you ever did, you would never grow. Eventually, because conditions change, we have to try new things. Conformity has been talked about in terms of its role in evolution, but I want to suggest to you today that there's another part of that equation, and that's creativity. So while conformity is necessary for evolution, I would suggest that it's not sufficient, that it also requires creativity. And let me see if I can make a case by looking at human history. And it's probably likely that the seeds for creativity began even before humans emerged in Africa, probably with our ancestors who used sticks for tools. But let's stick with human history. The first tool invented, created, manufactured by humans, Homo habilis, occurred 2.5 million years ago. It's called the flake tool. It was a rock that was uh, sharpened at one edge that could be used for splitting nuts and fruit. That lasted almost 1.4 million years. Now, if all we ever did was conform, we'd still be using that tool today. But something happened. Someone imagined another possibility. And that led to an innovation in stone tools called the hand axe. It's a symmetrical tool that can be held easily in the palm of the hand, which made striking much easier. That lasted about 600,000 years. And then something interesting happened. About 40,000 years ago, there was something archaeologists call the creative explosion. In Africa, Homo sapiens emerged the anatomically modern human. Homo sapiens took imagination and went beyond functional use of imagination. And they applied it to diverse areas. For example, at this time, we went from thrusting weapons, which means you have to be close to your prey, to throwing weapons. Body decorations emerged. Art emerged for the first time, cave paintings burial rituals, the production of clothing, purpose-built shelter, and so forth. What I suggest to you as a result of this, human history demonstrates that you were born to be creative. It's a natural part of who you are. But it doesn't have to stop there. We don't have to wait for our creativity to occur to magically appear. What we know through research is that you can take what's innate and you can develop it further. We can engage in what's called deliberate creativity. Creativity is like any other skill, like all abilities. What does that mean? We all have it. You've been born with it. We're not all the same, so we vary in the degree of creative ability that we have. But what we know is that through deliberate practice, through training, and through learning, you can enhance your creative thinking. In fact, that's the reason why we exist at Buffalo State. The founding faculty members of our department conducted an empirical study. Students who went through a creativity course, when compared to a control group, showed significant cognitive gains. So what is this creative cognition? What is this innate set of thinking skills that we're all born with? The two skills that we're all born with is an ability to engage in divergent thinking and convergent thinking. And some scholars believe about 40,000 years ago, one of the reasons why we had a creative explosion is that the mind developed, evolved in such a way that homo sapiens could begin to control their thinking and they could shift. That's called contextual focus. They could shift from divergent to convergent thinking. Divergent thinking is the ability to generate many varied and original options. It's the creation 
of variation. Convergent thinking is the selection, development of the most promising options. Now, isn't it interesting? Sounds a lot like evolution, doesn't it? What are the two fundamental properties of evolution? The creation of variation and the selective retention of those novel variations which enhance the ability to survive. So the same thought process seems to parallel the process of evolution. This is what we all have innately. But although we have this innate skill, we don't often use this skill, this gift, if you will, to the best of our ability. So let me talk a little bit about deliberate creativity. So we can all engage in divergent thinking, we can all engage in convergent thinking. What often happens when we have an idea, this novel idea? Sometimes the next thought that enters our mind is what? A reason why it won't work. It's too risky. So-and-so will criticize me. Here's another example that may make it easier to, to recognize this ineffective thought process. Imagine a meeting. Someone's called a meeting. There's a problem that has to be solved. The person who called the meeting says, right, we've got this tough nut of a problem. Anybody have any ideas? And someone shares an idea. What's often the next comment in that meeting? Yeah, it won't work. We don't have the budget for it. That's crazy. How about this one? We've tried that before. What happens to the creativity? It gets sucked out of the room, right? And what happens is we stick with the tried and true, this area of familiarity, really not that divergent in our thought process. We conform to what's known. So although we have this innate skill, sometimes we don't use it effectively. How can we deliberately enhance this skill of creative thinking? Well, two tips for you. First of all, learn how to suspend your judgment, to defer judgment. How often have you quickly criticized an idea only to find out later it really worked? If you move quickly to convergence, to judge fast, you may limit your ability to see new possibilities. Second tip, go for quantity. This is well documented. Dean Simonton, creativity researcher who looked at eminently creative people, found that one of the main differences between eminently creative people and ordinary people like myself is that eminently creative people generate many more ideas. Picasso had 20,000 works of art. Shakespeare wrote 154 sonnets, 37 plays. Edison, George Washington Carver, well-known inventors, had many invention ideas, of which a few revolutionized the world. I learned recently by listening to uh, NPR that Hemingway wrote 40 different <coughs> endings to his book for whom the bell tolls before he chose which one to go with. Linus, Paul, Linus Pauling, the Nobel laureate, said it best. The best way to have a good idea is to have lots of ideas. So if you want to be deliberately more creative, take advantage of what nature has given you. Learn to suspend your judgment. Don't jump to conclusions too quickly and learn to generate many ideas. Why is this important? Historically, hopefully I've made the case for how creativity has been part of our evolution, but that's historically. I would say today, creativity and creative problem solving has never been more important. The flake tool that I shared with you earlier lasted for how long? 1.4 million years. Today, manufactured products go through fundamental redesign every five to 10 years. In the area of technology, it's every six to 12 months. We can't afford to wait a million years for the next good idea. 
right? We can't afford to wait for the creativity muse to give us the breakthrough. We have to find ways to be deliberately creative, to accelerate what nature and evolution has given us. A global study completed recently, in fact, this year by Adobe, conducted around the world, 80% of those who were surveyed said that creativity is important to economic growth. When asked about their own creativity, one out of four surveyed, one out of four said that they were living up to their creative potential. When asked about their creativity experiences, especially their educational experiences, 59% said that schools stifled their creativity. And the US, because we like to lead the world, the number was higher. It was 62%. So what's happening? Here's one reason for why schools stifle creativity. This comes from Mark Runko, a creativity researcher. He says that most educational experiences or most educational efforts focus on convergent thinking. Remember divergent and convergent thinking? Finding the single right answer. Wouldn't it be nice if life was that simple? If every problem we came up to had only one single right answer? But it's not. And he says, therefore, these educational experiences may do very little, if anything, for creative potential. I would go a little further and suggest that in an era of standardization and accountability in schools, perhaps what we're teaching children to do is to be good conformists instead of teaching them how to be independent thinkers. Well, let's make this a little more personal. How about you and your creativity? Think about the degree to which you balance conformity and creativity in your own lives. Do you engage in flexible thinking? Do you engage in flexible behavior? Do you try new things? Are you open-minded? You may never, I hope, have to wrestle a tiger. But life is complex, and I am sure you will have to wrestle with tenacious problems. And J.P. Guilford, one of the pioneers in the field of creativity, said, to live is to have problems, and to solve problems is to grow creatively. Remember, evolution may not have made you particularly strong or particularly fast, but evolution has given you the gift of a creative mind. If you deliberately use it, if you deliberately develop it, I guarantee you, you will be more successful in dealing with life's complexities. Thank you. <laughs>